Typically, when you think about Christmas, you're thinking about the birth of a baby, and certainly that's what Christmas represents. But this morning, we're taking just a little bit different view on Christmas. Instead of the birth of a baby, the budding of a branch. And I know that may sound odd, and I've had people tell me in the past before, well, Scott, the Christmas tree's bad. You shouldn't have Christmas trees up because of this German tradition. It was worshipped by the, the Scandinavians, the Germans, and people throughout history. And so it's a form of idolatry, and you shouldn't have a tree. Well, um, I, you know, I don't tell people how to think. You can think however you choose to about it. Um, I happen to like a Christmas tree. Uh, I prefer them in uh, blue, like the blue bulbs, and maybe a silver tree with some nice blue light shining on it. Um, that is my preference. Trees probably don't grow naturally in the color of silver, but uh, Christmas trees are good, I think, if you use them for good things. You know, b- by the way, the Bible says that uh, 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 to, to people who have a clean heart, all things are clean. And to people who have an impure heart or an unclean heart, all things are unclean. So it's the motivation of the heart, not the, the actual physical metabolic structure of the the. the the uh, symbol or the emblem that makes something good or something bad. But you know the tree has a rich history of symbolism in the Bible. Did you know that? The tree. I'm going to give you uh, several of those. Um, uh, If you would, in your Bibles, find Isaiah chapter 11. I'm going to give you kind of a backdrop before we stand and read the text uh, together. But think about this, okay? I'm going to have you write down some things on your horizon. You need an open Bible, an open heart, and uh, a pen or something to write with, okay? So you can take some notes uh, as as God would have you to. Christmas represents a dual victory. Now now stay with me on this, okay? Because I'm going to go at a pretty good clip here. A dual victory. Number one, it's victory over the terror of death. Because from the beginning of time, if you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, um, when um, a man rebelled against God, that rebellion ushered in sin, and sin brought about the end uh, result of death. So from the beginning of, of, of the creation of mankind, people have been terrified of death. Anybody afraid of death? A couple people? Not very many. Okay, so... Uh, Dying, if, so, if folks were to stand back and, and, and you were to have an honest conversation with them, especially as people are in the hospital or somewhere else, people would say, it's a little scary. The uncertainty of death is a little scary. What's going to happen is a little scary. Uh, Christmas, however, one of the, 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 the two overarching principles of Christmas is to destroy or to eradicate this terror that we have about dying. I'll tell you more about that if we have time. The second purpose, so, is to give us victory over the terror of death. Secondly, to give us victory over the trials of life. Okay, so think about this. Over the terror of death and where we're ultimately going to go, and then over the trials of life and how we live our life uh, on this planet as many days as God gives us. There are several things that, that Scripture says that's anticipating the coming of the Messiah, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the birth of Yeshua. Um, let me give you a couple of these. Write these down, and you can go back and look them up later. Isaiah seven fourteen says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. So uh, uh, several hundred years, 750 or so, uh, prior to the birth of the Messiah, you see this prototype, uh, the, this prophecy of this coming uh, uh, virgin birth, which means um, Mary was impregnated by the power of the Holy Spirit. She had never been with a man. So, so the, 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 this time of the Christmas season is a time of supernatural birth. It's not like any other birth. You know, I heard somebody on TV the other day saying this. I've watched more TV, by the way, in the last five days than I have in five months. It's ridiculous. Been in, in this little square box watching uh, TV, but the, they, they've tried to promote the birth of the Christ child as some kind of nor, uh, normal, natural type of, of childbirth. It was nothing anywhere close to that. The birth of the Messiah, 
the birth of the Christ child was a supernatural event because Mary was a virgin. She had never been with a man before. Write down Isaiah 9, 6. That verse says, For a child has been born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So again, Isaiah is looking forward and anticipating the birth of the Messiah. Then if you fast forward to the New Testament, Luke chapter 1, verse 31, you just write, jot down the reference, you can look it up later. It says, and behold, you will conceive in your womb, and you will bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. So throughout history, you have the Bible anticipating the birth, the coming of the Messiah. So this Messiah is going to come. It's going to be supernatural. Everything was, was predicted down to the minutest detail. I've had uh, heard folks from the scientific community try to say, well, if we were to try to break this down, what are the chances or the probabilities that this would happen, that all these prophecies could be fulfilled, where the, the, the Messiah would be born, approximately when he would be born, the, the nature sur uh, surrounding his supernatural birth, the announcement of the angelic host, uh, the, the, the shepherds' uh, uh, entry into, into worshiping him, the, the, uh, um, the, the wise men or the magi that came to, to, to visit and worship him, you know, 18 or 24 months later, all of those events, in order for all those to happen, what are the chances that all those could be true? And, uh, you know, sci the scientific community says it, it, it's, it's impossible to put a number on that. In other words, you, you can't rationalize what the probability, all the things that would have to fall into place for this to occur this way. It had to be a supernatural event. It had to be God himself that was doing this. Would you please stand to your feet? We're going to read Isaiah 11, just verse 1. And from now on, hopefully you'll leave thinking Isaiah 11, 1 is a great Christmas passage. This is the word of God. Isaiah 11, 1 says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Father, we ask you to take your word and that you to make it effectual in our hearts and lives. Lord, that you change us and make us into a people that you'd have us to be. And Lord, even with heavy hearts and concern, uh, a love uh, for members of our family, uh, Lord, we ask for the power, the love, the, the, the joy, uh, the grace that comes from you to overpower heavy hearts, Lord, and that, uh, that the hope in you will shine brighter than anything else uh, this special time of year. It's in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So the birth of a baby is typically talked about. We're going to talk about the budding of a branch. Uh, jot down a couple of verses for me, if you would. There are five different ways. There's probably more than this, but these are kind of big overarching ways where the symbol of a tree Okay, the, and, of course, a branch coming off of a tree, where the symbol of a tree is used in the Bible. Let me give them to you. The first one was in creation, Genesis 2.9. It says, out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow all the trees of the garden. And, uh, of course, two trees of, of particular import were the, the, the tree of knowledge and the, and the tree of life. Right. So the, these trees you see present and mentioned uh, in creation, creation. You also see them in purification. Write down Exodus 15.23. It says, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. In Exodus 15, you'll see when we're coming to it in our trip through Exodus on Sunday mornings, um, uh, typically, that the Israelite people had left Egypt by God's strong hand. They come to this body of water. They were uh, dying of thirst. They needed water badly. They were dehydrated. And they, they, they find this body of water. They go to sample it or to take a drink of it, and the water was bitter. There was something wrong with the water. They couldn't drink it. It would make them sick. And what um, uh, Exodus 15 says is that they took a tree, and they took this tree, and they threw it into the water at the Lord Yahweh's command. And as they threw the tree into the water, then the water became drinkable, and it really saved uh, the nation of Israel. That tree saved them. That symbolizes the anticipation of the coming branch uh, that we would later call or recognize as the Lord Jesus Christ. It recognizes 
that purification. So the tree had to go into the water, then the water became drinkable. Here's the third one. Write this uh, reference down. It's Acts 5.30. And so we see the symbol of the tree in creation and purification. Thirdly, in salvation, Acts 5.30 says, God raised Jesus, whom you killed on a tree. Now, everyone knows, you know, well, Jesus was killed on a cross. But there are certain references, uh, the, the word staros in, in, in Greek, but there are certain references uh, uh, to, to a tree, to him being condemned to die on a tree. And back in, in uh, biblical times, to, for someone to be hung from a tree or to be tied to a tree, to be crucified, was a sign of great condemnation. The, the, the worst dregs of society were reserved this form of, of punishment. So we see it in salvation. So it's in creation, purification, salvation. Here's number four. Write down Psalm 1-3. We'll see it, this tree symbolizing sanctification. It says he'll be like a tree planted by streams of water. Remember the beginning of the book of Psalms? Psalm 1, where it talks about this tree that's planted by these life-giving waters. And that these life-giving waters causes the tree to grow and be strengthened. So the tree here symbolizes sanctification, which is a fancy church word for growth, how we grow as believers. Here's the last one. Revelation 22, not only is the tree symbolized in creation and purification, salvation and sanctification, but lastly in glorification, Revelation 22 two says, on either side of the river was the tree of life. So in the Jerusalem that is to come, the new Jerusalem, when, that, when the end of time comes, that same tree of life will be present. So the tree of life that we saw initially represented in the garden is ultimately going to be represented in the new Jerusalem, in a perfect community. So why do all these things, and the talk about trees, what's that have to do with the birth of Jesus Christ? Yeshua, the birth of the Messiah, Christmas time. This dual theme of victory, victory over the terror of death and victory over the trials of life. What does the tree have to do with that? Well, right in the middle of that entire uh, uh, scope of things, from Genesis to Revelation, is the book of Isaiah. Isaiah has 66 chapters. There are 66 books in the Bible. So Isaiah is kind of the Bible in miniature or compressed form. That's what the book of Isaiah is. In Isaiah chapter 11, this is an end times passage. Okay? It's not talking about today. It's not talking about you know, uh, Jesus' day. It's talking about a time in the future that we know that, uh, that uh, um, is represented that way because you'll see a, uh, a serpent, maybe a cobra, or an adder that, that will be playing with a child and not harm the child. The lion and the lamb will lie down beside each other n and neither hurting the other. It'll be a time of perfect peace, perfect harmony. So it's anticipating the future. And, you know, what I've shared with you before, uh, maybe a year or so ago back uh, in, in the other building, we talked about how if you're going to get a good aim on a, on a target, if you want to be more accurate in your theology or what you think about God, the study of God, theos, the study of God, if you want to be more accurate in that, it, it helps to have a, a longer view. Remember me giving you the example of a rifle? If somebody uses a rifle, they can be more accurate with a rifle typically because it has a long barrel, right? So what we want to do is look at a long view of this idea of the Messiah, a long view of this idea of the symbolic tree or the branch that comes from the tree. Make sense? If you see it from, from start to finish, then it helps us understand the purpose of Christmas. So Isaiah 11.1, 1, this is rich with symbolism. Okay? God embeds throughout Scripture all different types and layers of deep truth and meaning. Now, a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, something like that, there was a book that came out called The Bible Code. Anybody read The Bible Code or heard of it? Okay, uh, uh, anybody know what The Bible Code was based upon or what the theme of it is? No? Wow, good. You guys have been protected from this. It's junk. Don't go get it. Um, yeah, here, here's what it did. It, it took, the, you know, it, originally Scripture was written in such a way that the individual uh, uh, symbols or the individual letters were all compressed together. There was no punctuation. There was no uh, verse uh, uh, delineation. There was no chapters or anything like that. Those were all added 
several hundred years later. So all of it ran consistently together as one constant theme or one constant uh, 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 series of letters. Okay, you with me so far? So what they did was they took the, the Hebrew alphabet, uh, which has, is made up of 22 consonants. The, the, the Hebrew language doesn't have any vowels. We assign vowels to it to make it readable. It doesn't have any vowels. It's all consonants. There are 22 of them. It assigned each one of those a numeric value. It then took this code and put it into a computer database, um, and, and like, a, uh, like a crossword puzzle, printed off this code, and they, they started seeing on one uh, a page of these characters, certain things would be listed together. Like, um, uh, JFK was, was assassinated in what year? Okay, so it, I'm just giving an example, but it would say 1963, JFK. You know, and then it had stuff in there about Nostradamus and all these other kinds of things. So all these different codes that it says were in the Bible. Now, what you had to do, or what they wanted you to do, is to purchase this program. You know, they now, they now market it. You can buy this computer software program, which, which will, will, will break out these codes so you can do your own research. You can dig into it your, for yourself. Um, personally speaking, I think it's balderdash. I think it's bunk. I think it's untrue, okay? Uh, in other words, I think it's something to sell, uh, to, to sell books and materials. God tells us in his word what he wants us to know. He gives us, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, he gives us the, the unadulterated truth from God, right? And so then we, we take that truth and we absorb it. The more we obey what God says to do, the more we understand. The Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. So the more God gives us, the more we obey, the more we understand things and, and, and can grasp things. So I don't believe that there's a secret code. However... There is deep levels of rich meaning and symbolism throughout the Bible. Jesus is called, in this passage, a branch. Now, how do we know it was Jesus? Because if you read Isaiah 11, 2 through 6, it'll clearly show these attributes only apply to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is, he is, he is com described as being completely and wholly righteous. There's no one completely and wholly righteous except the Lord himself. So... Um, it, it's definitely a reference to him. So let me give you this uh, idea of how the branch symbolizes Christmas. On the front of your horizon, uh, Joe put this graphic on there. You see this little uh, branch listed, this budding branch? Well, this branch and that picture symbolizes Christmas. If you understand the Bible's message, not so much Western culture's message of Christmas, but if you understand the Bible's message of Christmas, that right there symbolizes Christmas as much as the mistletoe, the wreath, the Christmas tree, uh, uh, a, a, a short fat guy with white hair. You know, I mean, uh, this really symbolizes the Bible's view of Christmas. Okay, so let me give you kind of the backdrop to this. So the people in Isaiah's day, they understood the meaning of this, but they didn't understand the irony of this. In fact, we don't understand it today either, unless we were born in one of four towns in the United States. If we were born in Long Branch, New Jersey, we would understand the irony of this. If we were born in North Branch, Minnesota, Olive Branch, Mississippi, or West Branch, Iowa, we would understand the irony of this. But what Isaiah 11 1 is saying is this branch is going to come forth, and the branch is going to be born in Branch, Israel. Eretz, if you look at your horizon, E-R-E-T-Z, this literally means land. It typically describes the land of Israel. Well, from that word comes the word netzer, which is N-E-T-Z-E-R. Okay, that word literally means branch. Okay, so stay with me for a second. So if you take the word N-E-T-Z-E-R, it's not very far away from the word Nazareth. Nazareth 
is where we get our word Nazareth from. Okay? The word Nazareth also means branch. So Nazareth, Israel, is really branch, Israel. So think about the amazing truth of God. God caused the branch that would be, come forth in the Messiah to be born in branch or to, be, to, to, to come out of branch Israel. Now, of course, the Messiah is born in Bethlehem, but God orchestrates things. He engineers things by his sovereignty to bring him to Nazareth. So the branch of Jesse is revealed in branch Israel. Nazareth was a significant fork in the road town, okay? There was nothing else Nazareth was known, known for except for when you're coming down uh, uh, from the north into Nazareth, if you're, if you're headed down the, the southern reaches of Galilee into uh, Jerusalem, uh, Bethlehem, uh, the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, if you were going down into that area, the only thing that Nazareth did for you is it gave you a choice. You could take a western route and head toward the sea, or you could take an eastern route and come down the mountain range. So it was a fork in the road. That's all Nazareth was. It wasn't known for anything else. So when Jesus, in the synagogue, uh, opens uh, the, 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 the text of Isaiah, and talks about this, this Messiah that would come, and then he says, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing, I am he. Well, all the, 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 the men of the synagogue would have looked at one another and said, but you're a carpenter's kid who grew up in Nazareth. Nothing significant comes out of Nazareth. So it would have blown their minds that Jesus stands up and declares himself to be this promised Messiah here. Think about what God had to do to make this happen. Um, let me give you three examples. This is God's engineering. The reason I'm telling you this is because God's engineering your life and mine too today. But here's what he did. Number one, Jesus had to be born in Bethlehem even though Joseph, his earthly father, was not from Bethlehem. So it was very strange for, the, for them to make this trek here, but God caused it to be so. Number two, not only was he born in Bethlehem, even though Joseph wasn't from there, he also had to overcome the curse of Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was, a, was an evil king uh, that God cursed. And God said, you know, the rest of your lineage is going to be wiped out forever. Well, it just so happens that Yeshua comes through the lineage of Jehoiakim. So you're saying, well, how is that? How is that possible? Well, God retained the line of Solomon while wiping out that of Jehoiakim. So God, again, engineered by his sovereignty to work out the birth of the Messiah exactly according to plan. He then, thirdly, hurried him out of Bethlehem, then into Egypt to arrive back to Nazareth, or branch, Israel. So God, in his sovereignty, worked out all these things behind the scene, including evil, wicked kings who wanted to destroy the Son of God, evil, wicked kings that hated the Jewish people as a whole, God worked out all these things, even using powerful kings, uh, 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 evil people. He worked out all these things to bring about the birth of the Messiah exactly how he wanted it to occur. Why is that important? Because the same God who was engaged in this amazing sovereign engineering project is still engineering lives today. In fact, today... He's still allowing us to have victory over the terror of death. He's still allowing us to have victory over the trials of life through this branch called the Messiah. Uh, Jeremiah 23, 5 says, God will raise up for David a righteous branch. Zechariah 6, 12, and 13 says, This royal branch will be he who rebuilds the temple. John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the true vine. You are the branches. So, so think about this. So God takes us through this process from the beginning of time. You know, a lot of people, when they, when they tell the, the Christmas story, it begins in Luke or, or, or Matthew chapter 1. You know, that, that's not where the, the, the birth of the Messiah began. In fact, it began in eternity past. 
God already had the plan, already delivered the, the, the Messiah. Yeshua himself already volunteered for the project. He wasn't, um, is it conscripted? What's it called, called when, the, when the military, uh, like, drafts you? Or uh, is it conscription? Okay, well, he wasn't forced into service, right? Jesus volunteered for this mission. And by volunteering for this mission, in eternity past, before there was ever a planet Earth, when he, when he did this, he qualified to be this righteous branch that came from God. Now, he's called the branch of Jesse. Why the branch of Jesse? Why not Abraham or why not Adam? Well, he's called the branch of Jesse because Jesse, very little is said about him in the Old Testament except for one thing. Do you know what it is? He's the father of who? David. David in the Old Testament is a type, a prototype of Yeshua, of the Lord Jesus himself. Now, it's not saying that Jesus is exactly like David. Jesus was perfect, and David was far from it. But there were certain things about David that, that presented a picture of the forerunner of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you, you, you see this branch of Jesse coming forward in David first, and then ultimately in, in Jesus himself. Now, think about this. Um, anybody know, we have some tree experts Anytime I ever talk about anything agricultural, I have to, to rack my brain on research because I know nothing about it, and I know there are people here that do. So I have to, you know. Anytime I talk about anything legal, we have legal beagles in our midst, so I have to make sure that I'm saying, you know, things that, that are correct. When I, when I talk about, you know, goats, you know, we have a resident goat expert, so I have to know what I'm talking about for all these things. She stepped out of the room right now. She didn't, y'all tell her I said that when she gets back. A tree, that, that what this is describing here, this branch, was really a tree that had been cut down, okay? And it's really more of a sprout than a branch. And so if you think about a stump, the stump of Jesse, it was, the line of Jesse was tried to be wiped out, attempted to be wiped out by the world, the flesh, and the devil, conspired so that the Messiah would never arrive, so that, that this tree was cut down. Now, symbolically speaking, a sprout emerges, a branch, not out of the top of the tree, but right around the root system around the tree. Now, what that sprout represents is the promise of this original tree is going forward. Write down Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, the Bible talks about that, that, that God had chosen a special group of people. He set his affection and favor on a special group of people. Who were they? The Jewish people, Right? In fact, they're still his chosen people. Now, I know people give pushback to that, but you can take that up with God himself. Now, th his chosen people were chosen for what purpose? For what purpose? Yes, what were they supposed to do? Yeah, they're, they're, they're supposed to, they were supposed to be the standard bearers for the, for, the, for the glory of God. They were supposed to carry that to the world. Have they succeeded? Not so much. To a great degree, they failed in their mission. But if you read in Romans chapter 11, what that says is that that, that, that that original plant, that original tree was removed. And a new vine or a new tree was grafted into it. That's called the Gentile. So the Gentiles were grafted into this tree. For what purpose? So that the mission of God would go forward. Because without the grafting into the Gentiles, the mission of God would not have gone forward because the Jewish nation did not do it. I expected, y'all know I, um, I had uh, a, a, a Messianic rabbi come and speak. and A uh, great guy. I, I've enjoyed him very much. Um, but I anticipated things from the, the, the rabbinic community that they just don't seem to develop. I mean, I think I study more about their culture and their heritage than they do. I think I do deeper word studies and symbology than they do. And not everybody, I'm generalizing. But it's kind of frustrating because their, their, their culture and their history is so deep and so rich and so powerful, you could truly not understand Christmas if you don't see the Jewish perspective of it been a little disappointing that they don't recognize that 
I mean, the Messiah came to them, to their people. And they themselves didn't recognize it. In John 15, what I referenced to you a few minutes ago, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. So what began in the very beginning as the development of, of, of this branch that was anticipated, Jesus says that he, he is born in this, this, this manger in Bethlehem. He is born, he, become, he takes on flesh and blood, becomes life, so that the, the, our terror of death is defeated, our trials over life are defeated, and then he, he carries that mission forward by being infused into us. And so that, that, that tree that was cut down now is being sprouted up in the form of us, his church, his people. It's us that are to do this. So think about God's sense of humor. He says that this branch is going to be born in Nazareth or going to, to, to come out of Nazareth, be identified with Nazareth, branch, Israel. The, the power and the meaning behind it is, is God, it, when, when, this, when the stump was cut out, when the tree was cut out, leaving only this stump, this dead stump in its place, that this branch comes forth out of that, that the death of David brings forth the life of Christ, that the death in Adam, that, so the, in Adam all men die, yet in Christ all men live. So what, what happens then is this sprout, this branch coming forth out of the stump brings forth the, the promise of an eternal future for God's people. Make sense? And it's all coming out of branch, Israel. So where does that leave us? James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, talk about the trials that we face in life and how our attitude toward those trials is to be a positive attitude, knowing that the end of trials work is our uh, maturity, our completion in Christ. So it's the trials, the difficult things in life that actually make us complete. In fact, because of the human condition, the human heart being so rebellious, if it weren't for trials in our lives, we would not reach the point of completion that God would have us to, to, to be at, for us to be shaped and conformed to the image of Christ. Romans 8, 28 and 29. We would never get to that point if it weren't for the trials and the difficult things in life. So this service started off heavy because we're hurting for members of our family. Our hearts don't have to be heavy. We can have a heart of compassion that is a light heart that's still full of joy. So I can be compassionate toward people that are hurting, but still be full of joy because I know that I have, I am, have confessed true faith in this, bran this branch, this sprout that came from Jesse, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and because of my faith in that, a branch is coming in me, that that, that fruit is, is being grown in me. The Bible says I can't produce fruit, I can only bear it. But as God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is working in my life because of a little baby that, that were God taking on flesh, because of that, then, then, then fruit can be born out in my life in the form of mercy and love and compassion and confrontation and, you know, all the, 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 the beautiful things that God works in us. All that's possible because of the branch. I was going to carry one in here today, like an, an evergreen branch, and, and, uh, and use it as an object lesson. Um, but you've all seen a branch, so you know what one looks like. That symbol gives us hope. That hope that Jesus, uh, uh, in and through our difficulties, overcomes anything that we ever face. The Bible, uh, 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 12, Jesus, when Paul was, was complaining about this thorn in the flesh, that three times he had, he, had, he had requested that this thorn in the flesh, we don't know what it was, all kinds of debate, but he had requested this thorn in the flesh be removed three times, but God refused to remove the thorn in the flesh. Jesus responds, if you have a Bible that has 
uh, red letter uh, version where, where all the words of Christ are in red. It really sticks out because in, 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 uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, there aren't any words of Christ except for these. And he, Christ says, my grace is sufficient for you. Because in your weakness, my strength is manifest. So it's when we're weakest that God has the opportunity to show his strength. His grace begins to flow through us. So when it looks like the stump is dead, it's not. There is a branch coming out of the stump. There's a sprout of future hope, future life, absolute promises of God, sovereignly orchestrated and engineered by God to bring about his ultimate purposes. And God's ultimate purposes, you know, I, I read some, some, a, a post by someone this week that said, you know, we've read the end of the book, and the end of the book is we win. For those who are found in Christ, you are more than conquerors. If you read the book of Revelation, you are overwhelming victors in Christ. When you walk in Christ and live and move and give your being to Christ, when, when that baby born in a manger represents your Lord and everything that you live for, your significance, your purpose, your identity, when that happens, then, then, then everything in life that comes from you can be blessed by God. In other words when I'm obedient to what God's word says for me to do, then God works through that obedience and blesses it. His grace is infused in the middle of my inadequacy. His strength in my weakness. His knowledge in my ignorance. All the, the things that I lack serves as this perfect stage, like this, this ridiculous boxing ring. It serves as a perfect stage to showcase the magnificent grace of God. 